I said last time you confused the F out of a lot of people who were listening and they were like, white where? Where is she white? I don't believe you. She's got a black ancestor. Well, news alert, we all have black ancestors, all of us. And um, y'all were bugging. And so I just, you know, and I said to you, I said, I think it might be unfair because I wanted you to, you know, come here and gather white women today. I was like, you have so much more to offer. And you were like, well, that's my work. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm always happy to to put in my two cents on that. I mean, especially I, I often have to gather myself too. So um, you know, I, what does that look like? When when does that happen, Olivia? <laughs> that happens all the time. Um, that happens all the time. Even in writing, I was actually on a call um earlier this week with two women who are using the new book uh for some like um conversations they're having with their employees. Um, it's a mostly white company, and these are two black women who are kind of as usual, being asked to clean up the mess that has been created um, by this kind of uh, toxic work culture, and so they're wanting to use my book to have these conversations. And um, and I w- and they asked me about that about the the self gathering, and it happens a lot, um, you know. But especially in my writing, where I realize kind of my racist socialization still gets in the way sometimes of of my craft, of um, you know the the way that I edit my work. Uh, sometimes I'll realize that a setting, you know, good writing. Uh, well, a mentor of mine, Daniel Jose Older, he always said that um, racist writing is a craft failure. And it is um, because, well, you'll have your craft lens on where you're writing and you're talking about setting. And when I teach setting to my students um, in Kentucky, you know, one of the main things I teach is that setting should be a character almost. It should have a connection to the people that are in it. It should have a history. It should have a way of moving in the book. And, um, and when you write racistly, uh, all of that knowledge of craft falls away. The the and, and I've done that in my writing. I in writing the truth about white lies, where I'm writing, um, you know, a neighborhood that the main character Shania is moving through, and I recognize like this this neighborhood that this doesn't feel authentic. This doesn't feel real. And then I realize, oh, my racist projections that I'm still unlearning are overpowering and overshadowing the craft work that I've done. And it's a constant uh, checking of self. It's a constant um reorganization of self so it happens all the time yeah how much uh someone uh said to me i i mentioned i said something about being blackballed and they were like i'm so disappointed you said you were blackballed we have to get away from using black in a negative way and i'm surprised at you for using that term and, you know, I would often correct people when they talk about slaves. I was like, nope, they were in, they were human beings. Something happened to them. They were enslaved. But I'm like, at some point, though, we're we're should we be policing to to that level? Should we be it, correcting it, to that level? I mean, you know, it, it, it there's there's no uh, I feel like correct level there's racism at every every level of our society from our language to you know our justice system um you know everywhere i I feel like it it it, we have to do as much as we can but also i feel like i was talking about this with someone i think this morning about you know this isn't exactly what you're talking about but you know the focus on microaggressions and things like that that i think specifically white people do um among each other um the the constant kind of oh, is that a microaggression? You should say that, that could be offensive. And that often, that hyper-focus on those small things uh, allows us to, and gives us, I say us white people, permission to overlook systemic issues and to, you know, by focusing on those little things, sometimes we miss the bigger point. I I would say often we miss the bigger point um, and it turns into, um, you know, uh, a contest almost of, you know, the, what can you, what can you nitpick the most? What can you take apart the most? How tiny can you get with this? And does, does it actually change anything? Cause that's really the, the focus, you know, for me often. And I, again, I do this too, where I have to step back and be like, okay, is this actually helping anything? Or is this a way of assuaging my guilt? Or is this a way of preserving my goodness? Um, Cause I think white folks were often very concerned with you know, uh, keeping our goodness intact. Uh, goodness is such a big part of the myth of whiteness. So, um, so yeah, I mean, you know, yes, it's useful to critique language always, of course, but also um, let's, let's keep our eye on the ball is how I feel. I'm, I'm curious, Olivia, what, what in your background uh, caused you to go on this journey? I mean, your, <clears throat> your level of consciousness around race and around whiteness 
and how whiteness shows up in the context of white women is is very extraordinary and unique. So I'm just curious, what is it in your journey that has led you to this place? Um, black women. <laughs> That's uh, going to be my answer so often uh, when I'm asked any type of question like that is black women. Black women and black girls, you know, is this, I feel like my journey started when I was very young. Um, I was very lucky to encounter, you know, black girls and black women who loved me enough to um, get me on the right path and to make me question things um, that I, that didn't occur to me to question small things that, you know, seemingly had nothing to do with race, but, um, you know, the, the things that contradicted the messages that I was given from society, from family members, um, you know, all those things. So, and then that went on and it wasn't a smooth journey at all. Uh, Karen and I talked about this my last visit on here. I mean, there were definitely times and are still times that I missed up and fall into um, patterns that are made very easy for me. I mean, that's the thing white folks are, where I think we're often like, well, what do you expect from me? You know, and stuff like that. And it's like, well, there is some fairness to that because um, at every turn we are given messages that make it very easy and very convenient to be racist and um, to fall into those patterns that are very beneficial to us. Um, but, you know, in, W.B. Du Bois talked about like the wages of whiteness, right? And like the things that we, even if we are getting shafted also by this, you know, capitalistic, uh, violent society, um, we still get this psychological wage. And I think that, um, I think might just be a personality thing for me. I hate the idea of getting something I didn't earn. Um, and once it became clear to me that that was happening, um, I wanted to divest from that is as much as possible. And I know that's an ongoing journey as well. Um, I'm sure there are things that I haven't even, haven't even occurred to me yet, you know, um, but I, you said consciousness and um, I think being white in this country is to be in a state of stupor um, and it's easy to fall back asleep. So um, I, I try to, to stay as conscious as I can, but, um, but black women, black women, you know, both scholars and friends and family and friends of friends have always been uh, the first people to um, guide me to the path and then remind me when I step off. Mm. I literally watched somebody fall back asleep mm. um, from being disconnected because they were part of the daily uh, rigors of the show and would have to every day be in community with the folk. And this is a man of a certain age who, you know, hardwired into, you know, this thing not, and then his eyes were open and he became this like crusader. And then I've watched him over the last two years during this pandemic, because now you're not every day forced into this space. And we had a conversation the other day and I was like, I had to light his ass up. Wow. Yeah. But I realized I was like, maybe I should give him some grace. I was like, nope, no grace for you. No, no. grace for you. You don't get a chance to go to sleep. You're going to remember real quick because yeah. I'm going to hit you in the head verbally. <laughs> Wake up. He's yeah. lucky, but I hate that you have to do that. You know, that should. Well, I'm, I'm here for it, though, Olivia. I was built for that. So there, don't it's OK. I I will do it. I'll, I'll actually, you know, rent out my services. Anybody that needs a, a swift <laughs> verbal kick in the butt. I'm here for it. 866-801-8255. Part of uh, your journey, I want to play a clip that I was saving for, for you, actually. Shavar's here. I was going to play it with him. I was like, let me see what Olivia feels about this, because I think this guy was kind of inadvertently talking about you. Uh, his name is Trucker Randy. Um, he's running for office, which is why that's important. Michigan State Senate. He switched parties. He's running as a Democrat because it's probably easier in the district to win as a Democrat, which is why I was like, don't get caught up in, caught up in partisan politics, people. Do not mm. get caught up in parties. You got to know the people. March 31st on his radio show is now coming out because he's got some scandal around him as well. He, do we have the clips, Miss, where we could just play it? Okay, here's what he said. What percentage of our population is black? In some areas, it's three, five, seven percent. Others, it's 13 percent nationwide. I, th I think the nationwide black, I'm not talking about Hawaiians or Polynesians or people like Kamala Harris, who's not black. I'm talking about real African-American heritage black people. So why are we talking so much about voter suppression? 
you will not believe what this country looks like 20, 30, 40 years from now if we continue down this path with public indoctrination of our kids on their socialist communist agenda. What is it? Destroy the nuclear family. Destroy it. Take away your morality. Take away your values. Take away your religion and brainwash you when you sit and watch TV. Now, every single commercial has a biracial mom and dad. Can't even watch a college basketball tournament without commercials telling me I have to feel guilty because I think a family should be a white mom, a white dad, and white kids. They want us to die and go away. So, And they're going to try to do it through politics this year. Oh, is that what's happening? Wow. Not that whiteness is a made up construct is just you, it's unsustainable as it's, it's unsustainable as recessive genes being a master race. That's mm-hmm. unsustainable. Biologically, it just cannot. You can't keep that going. You're eventually going to have to change. Oh, but then that requires knowledge. OK, y'all both heard this Olivia Cole as you were listening to him. He went in much. Di- but at the crux of this is a fear of no longer existing. This made up construct. Mm-hmm. But you you're raising a little black, little black girl. I saw the pictures of her. You, mm-hmm. y'all, you look like you really love her a lot. <laughs> this is your daughter. Um, <laughs> you are a problem to Randy, trucker Randy, because you are not representing the white family with the mm-hmm. white daddy, the white mama, and the white babies. How do you yeah. feel about that? I, I get a lot of messages from people like Randy. Um, and th- those are some of the, the most disturbing ones I get, you know, I, I get a lot of, you know, the usual stuff. Um, but those are the most disturbing ones, the ones who, uh, are really, really focused on my uterus and like the abomination of my womb and, you know, all of that. And, um, wait, and, wait, by giving birth to a chocolatey child, yeah, you yeah. defiled your, your I womb, defiled my, my white woman purpose. Um, yeah. So uh, it, it gets weird, you know, it gets really weird, but I think, you know, when it comes like white women don't, uh, don't, a lot of white women don't know, you know, like the history of, um, you know, the anti-abortion movement and, you know, the, the, the fight against like, women's women's choice the choice uh so much of that is rooted in white supremacy and white men trying to preserve um you know white superiority and preserve the white race and you know uh that's i've I've researched a lot for the truth about white lies um what draws white women to two people like trucker randy who um you know, he's saying the quiet part out loud. Uh, and, and I mean, really, he just put it all in there. I, that was uh, pretty amazing, actually. Just, I'm mean, they're, you know, not holding back at all. Like, we're just going to say it all. Um, we're going to say it all and put it all together. But, um, but in researching white women and how they're drawn to, you know, white nationalist groups, how they're drawn to, to people like Randy, and, um, and then also then what turns them away and what eventually um, c- causes these white women to leave these groups and to turn their backs. And, uh, and it, I think it's once they get in there and realize just how deeply misogynist it, it, it always is. Um, and white women uh, are, ser- are searching for, you know, some people call it the patriarchal princess, like the, the they want to be close to power, you know, um, and white men's power is, you know, that's, that's what they're seeking. They, 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 <laughs> the type of women that are gravitating towards those groups are the type who want to be close to as close to that power as possible but then once they get close to it they realize that it's never going to be attainable um they are always going to be you know a a womb um essentially and that's what drives them away but you know if you know your history you wouldn't be surprised um and there's such um there's such a mainstreaming that needs to happen about the knowledge of the invention of race and the the history of of the um, I mean the his, yeah the history of race and how it was invented and what purpose it has served and what purpose it continues to serve um, and if we knew that then I, people people like Randy would have a lot less popularity um, at least in theory right. Um, mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think. Yeah. Good. Uh, Olivia Cole, let me just reintroduce. 
let me reintroduce olivia a cole cole is here olivia a cole ranting owl is where you can follow her at least for now on twitter for now we'll see, twitter stays. We'll, we'll, we'll see we'll see um and what she's talking about actually can be seen in the recent um move against roe v wade state to state to state to state and it's usually presented by women in a state legislature uh that they, they're, they're presenting these very restrictive abortion laws throughout the country one of those is going to go up to the Supreme Court with this current Supreme Court. One of these laws will definitely hit the Supreme Court and it probably will overturn nationally the woman's right, women's right to have an abortion. But that's rooted in what Randy was talking about, which is interesting to me that women are going along with it. Mm-hmm. What's wrong with them? I think what Olivia said is really just so on point in terms of the intersectionality of race and gender. Um, and how, you know, many white women see themselves as white, you know, women and white first. Um, and, you, you, you know, we know white women were at the heart of the election of, of Donald Trump. And we know that um, as she laid out, the intersection of white supremacy and misogyny has been at the heart of uh, um, the enslavement of Africans as well as Jim Crow for a long period of time, right? I mean, the, the entire premise of lynching largely was what we saw in the context of Emmett Till and countless others, some sort of perception or concern that the purity of white women would be jeopardized. So even what she talked about in terms of the sanctity of her white womb being defiled by a black baby. I mean, the stuff is so absurd when you articulate it, um, but because racism is absurd and it's a paranoia uh, and it's, it's, a dysfun- it's a dysfunction, it's a psychological dysfunction. And I think it's important to name it that way. And it was obviously created to serve a variety of different capital, capitalistic interests associated with the commodification of black bodies. And, but we continue as we know to suffer. And we're obviously in an environment now when we look at the movement against critical race theory, the banning of books, where even the basic knowledge of racism and its invention and how it's played out throughout American history is so, uh, anathema to these core values that people don't even want to begin to have the conversation. And so I just really think what Olivia said, you know, is really so on point, just really speak to how much work we still have to do as a country. Well, and what Shavar, yeah, what you just said is also just right back at you. Um, so, so on point, especially, you know, that where the capitalism comes in, um, you know, and how, how white supremacy and capitalism are so much, uh, you know, interwoven and inseparable uh, and, you know, the the idea of uh, of like the like white women seeing themselves as white uh, ourselves as white first um, and then what trucker Randy said about you know like looking on TV and you know how you know the an advertisement you know how this like it's being advertised to us um, that always fascinates me um, how how advertising. <laughs> how two people can look at these advertisements and, you know, these you know, liberals will see this, oh, look at this progressive commercial, um, you know, this, and, and, you know, this is the thing, Randy, he, he, he makes this point where, yes, he, there is always the biracial mom on these commercials, right? But he sees it as this, um, this degeneration where I see it as this capitalistic posturing that still erases mm-hmm. blackness, you know? Yes, like, black people oh. don't like those commercials either. <laughs> So there's a lot of black people that are like, come on now, where where is the black daddy with the black mama? That Cheerios exactly. commercial. Why are all of the black men or all the black women have to have white spouses? So it's we're having the same conversation from different, different angles. Oh my God. Let me ask you, um, because Amy Coney Barrett adopted two Haitian children. She's got two black children. And and I can go down a list, I can probably spend all day telling you all the white people, including Mitt Romney and them and John McCain and them, they got black children in their households. I, I, I fear for those babies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I do, I do. As a white woman, Olivia Cole, what's your responsibility to raising your daughter in this world that we're in and how, I know you're doing the work, but how detrimental is it for children in these spaces, not just not getting their hair done properly, which could it be can, traumatic. I think it cannot be understated how 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 dangerous and, and disruptive and harmful it is. Um, you know, I, I've known black friends who were raised in white households um, and the damage that it does, I think is just, uh, it's inconceivable, um, especially when you get the fundamentalist Christian lens then laid over the top of it also, because that's a whole nother thing, especially, you know, you get, in, well, not especially anywhere, but in Kentucky, the Bible Belt, there is a special thing that happens there um, with, with that. But, 
you know, the idea of enslavement and how that happened, you know, what, what that's doing in Christianity. And then you've got a white family where you're raising a black child. And like you said, it's not just the hair. I think a lot of people focus on the hair um, because that's the most obvious, you know, example, but, um, you know, the, the devaluing that hap happens there, the dehumanization, the, the unpersoning, the cut off, cutting off from um, self and history. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's terrifying to me, uh, especially, you know, having a black daughter. Um, I, I get this question a lot, you know, like, how are you raising her? And then I think people hear my answer and they think I'm a little, a little nuts, but, um, you know, we, there's, I know that I'm going to get pushed back on this, but you know, this, this is the honest answer. There is no, nothing white in our house. Um, we, we, I'm the, the only really white person in this house. All of my, all my friends are black for one thing. So that not all, but like all of my closest friends are black. The ones that are her aunties, the ones that are, that come visit, you know, are all black, but we don't have white books in this house. We don't watch television show she didn't start watching tv until in the middle of the pandemic um so she's four she'll be five in october but um she didn't start watching tv until she was about three really and we are extremely choosy about what she watches um i she can maybe watch half hour a day and um like tab time is a new one i, I tweeted about this recently but tabitha brown she has a great show where um, it's if the if the main character is not black, then she's not watching it. Um, we go to old school reading Rainbow. Um, we do Gullah Gullah Island. We do all that stuff. But if the main character is not black, she's not watching it. And then I also and this is where people because when people are like okay okay, but then to me also if the supporting character is not also black, then we're not watching it um, because I have a wait. You black? You're blacker than most of the black people listening right now, <laughs> Olivia. Uh, I promise uh, you. <laughs> Oh no, I, that is not true, <laughs> but, um, no, I'm just, I'm very, uh, I'm also, I, so I'm, I'm, I'm OCD. I, I am medicated for OCD and, um, are you really caring? We gotta talk. Well, not medicated. I probably should be, but I'm all right with it. I'm living with <laughs> you. <are. laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I struggle with OCD and I think that, um, that definitely contributes to the way that I, you know, live my life, shapes my life in a major way. Um, but I, I am very um, strict about things. I have a real problem with, uh, I'm a writer, as you know, so picture books, they're so often like black children, they'll have a main character that's a black child, but then the black child's best friend is always white. I call it the white chaperone. There's always a white chaperone um, in children's books and in things even like, and people are gonna hate this, but Doc McStuffins, I don't like Doc McStuffins because the best friend is always white. And um, that bothers me, you know, so I don't ever want my daughter to feel like she needs a white chaperone for one thing, but that she um, has something to fear by being in an all black space, um, because I think that's the projection that we're seeing when we see a, a book being published or a show being produced where the main character is black, but nobody else is. I think that what we're seeing there is the projection, the projected fear of whiteness um, the publishing industry and, you know, Hollywood, um, the projected fear of blackness. It's what Randy's talking about, right? That taking over that, uh, where are the white people? Where, who's in charge here? Because if no one white is present, then that means, you know, they are running it. He said they, right? And that, in that advertisement, that little segment, like that they was so terrifying, um, both to him and to me, you know, because what it means to him and what it means to me, like when he's seen the they as, um, anybody not white, you know, that's, that's terrifying. So I, when I see that, um, you know, in, in a book, in a show that just, I know what it means and I can't look away from it. So, um, we are very strict about what, what she sees and, um, but in a way the pandemic has helped, right? Because we haven't been anywhere. So I'm, I'm, I'm worried about what's going to happen when she gets to school, you know, because I know I, I can only control this environment for so long. Um, mm. but I, I hope that by building this very black, very proud foundation that, you know, she's going to run into, because people who say it's so extreme, I'm like, is it extreme when she's going to go outside this door and it's going to be the exact opposite, you know, like it is going to be whiteness everywhere. It's going to be, you know, she's going to be inundated with that whiteness. As soon as I let her watch TV and supervise, it's going to be white, 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 white. So, you know, it's, to me, it's building up, um, hopefully, you know, a foundation that will be strong enough to with, withstand that tidal wave that's coming.
as I'm listening to you, I wish we had all of us a nth of the absolution in what is what we will and will not do. I feel like we make too many concessions. Shavar and I was talk, we, were, we were talking about this before you came in. We make concessions in our music. We make concessions in our watching habits. But those algorithms are the things that drive, literally drive the economy. Mm. And most of that is us. We talk about Twitter today. The only reason why it's a big deal is because we all know that black Twitter is a driving factor on Twitter with no governing, you know, voice, no vote, no, no money. None of that forty five billion dollars is going to quote unquote black Twitter because it's not really a thing, but it's absolutely a thing. Same with TikTok, same with Facebook, same with all of the television shows, the movies that are out there. You know, when they know that they can make money off of us without having to pay us, that's what they'll do. Mm-hmm. And in publishing right now, there's a wave of blackness because that is what is demanded. Somebody just asked me a question because we do a book every month and they were like, you know, are you, you know, are you, how do you codify it? I was like, well, we're not actually doing the algorithm thing, but mm-hmm. I know that we're having an impact because I know that book sales in these areas of the books that we're talking about have gone up. And it's a direct result of something that I can't prove, but I know in my spirit. Let me ask you this. Olivia Cole is here. And you can definitely call up and ask whatever question you want. Shavar is here as well. Shavar Jeffries, 866-801-8255. Self-hating. I know you probably get a lot of, uh, you know, mail, email, you know, commentary, social media that you are a self-hating white woman. You hate yourself. Mm-hmm. Talk to that. Um. I think that that's fear talking when people, when people say that, I think that they're very afraid um, in the same way that trucker Randy is afraid. Um, it's a, a fear that, uh, that I'll stop doing what the white women that we're talking about that join the white nationalist groups that, you know, Shavar said, you know, they see um, themselves as white first. Um, there's a fear that, that I will no longer see myself as white first. Um, and what that could mean for the chokehold that white supremacy has, um, you know, white supremacy to work requires compliance. Um, and when we do not comply, we being everybody now, not just the white we, but everybody, you know, we, we, if we do not comply, then it can't function. Um, so, you know, self-hating is, is such a funny thing because I love myself. Um, I love myself. Um, whiteness, I do not love. And I think that is a fun, when, when you see yourself, when you have your self image and your identity and your life so wrapped up in whiteness and those wages that it brings, then to say, I love myself, but I hate whiteness sounds, um, like a contradiction sounds like that, that can exist. Um, but whiteness is not real. It has very real impacts, obviously, uh, material impacts, but, and psychological ones, you know, but it is, it is made up. And when we talk about abolishing whiteness, we're not talking about abolishing individual white people, of course. And that's the kind of gotcha that, you know, the trucker Randy's like to do, like, you're talking about killing white people, you know, um, the, this is genocidal talk. And it's like, well, white supremacy is genocidal. So of course it will always hear genocide um, because that's mm. its goal. Um, so it, you know, the same way that um, when white people, when, you know, racists will say, uh, you know, like, well, if when there's a, a brown or a black majority, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to come and do all the things to us that we did to them. And it's like, well, of course, that's where your mind goes, <laughs> um, because that's your the way you formed your world. But not everybody's thinking that way. And it's the same way for when, you know, we talk about abolishing whiteness, the fact that the first thought is genocide. It's like, well, when you've built your whole ideology and your, you know, your history around genocide, of course, that's where your mind goes. But abolishing whiteness is beneficial to all of us. Um, white people, our, our lives are, um, would be immeasurably improved if we stopped voting for the interests of the power structure and started voting for the interests of our, of ourselves, you know, um, because we will historically, we will always vote against things if we think that it will help black people, even if it will also hurt us by voting against it. Um, so, you know, uh, do am I self-hating? Uh, no, but there but I, I'm, I'm white and that is something that requires 
critical examination and interrogation and um, and dismantling of self. So you know, it, it's a it's a it's a fine line. Um, am I constantly trying to dismantle the parts of myself that come from a system that I hate? Yes, that doesn't mean I hate myself. 